Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andrew Horgan, and I'm the Chief Development Officer here at Pioneer Institute and the Pioneer Public Interest Law Center. For those of you who are new to Pioneer, our mission is to empower our citizens with practical, innovative solutions to help provide the best education possible for our kids, to ensure that all citizens have access to affordable and transformational health care, and to promote public policies that ensure the Commonwealth is a place where our residents have every reason to stay because the state is economically competitive, local businesses are able to offer plentiful jobs, and housing is affordable. We achieve these goals through a tireless commitment to evidence-based research, sharing educational content, and a steadfast belief that the solutions that we are all looking for will be found at the state and local level, not in Washington, D.C. And while we live in a society that continues to be driven by clickbait headlines and opinions rather than facts, we wholeheartedly believe that individuals will make the best choices for themselves, their families, their businesses, and communities, as long as they are provided with thoughtful, readily understood analysis. Which brings us to our conversation today on Massachusetts outmigration problem. I am so pleased to have the opportunity to introduce Jim Sturgios, Executive Director of Pioneer Institute, and Mark Williams, Executive in Residence and Master Lecturer in Finance at Boston University's Questrom School of Business. Jim and Professor Williams will begin with a review of the findings from a nine-month study conducted by the BU team. They will then take a deep dive into some of the more alarming statistics related to out-migration trends and policies that are driving talent to leave the state. We want to be sure to provide plenty of opportunity for all of you to ask questions and to engage in today's webinar. With well over 100 attendees participating, we ask that you utilize the chat function throughout the presentation should you have any questions or areas you would like Jim and Professor Williams to provide more detail. With that, it is my pleasure to turn things over to Jim and Professor Williams. It's a pleasure to be with all of you. Thanks for making time today. It's great to be with you, Mark. Great Thank to be you. with you, Jim. So um, just a couple quick comments and we're gonna get Professor Williams right into it. Uh, the overall uh, analysis that we'll be talking about is massive in scope. It, it spans about 75 slides. We're not gonna get to all of that. You as the audience have received this in email and you'll find it in the chat, a link to it. I would really urge you to take a deep look at it uh, yes, there are the headlines, but the sub takeaways are really important as well. Again, Mark, thank you for being with oh, us. Absolutely. Appreciate all that your team did on this. I'd just like to start before we get into the slide deck, just talk a little bit about why this study, who was on it, methodology, what was your motivation in doing the work? Sure. Uh, well, very interested in what's happening in Massachusetts. This change in migration pattern itself has happened over the last decade. So I really wanted to quantify it. And fortunately, what we have is a pool of data. Uh, the US Census, for example, and the IRS provide us with lots of data. So really it's a matter of swimming in the pool and then actually coming up with an understanding better about the trends that are happening. And that's exactly what this group did. That's great. Well, there's a lot that you swam through. I was hoping maybe you'd, uh, you'd kind of chart us through the waters you, you got through and maybe we'll go through the, the deck if that's all right. Sure. Sure. So in, in essence, uh, the first part of the project itself was really to take a look at uh, the migration patterns in Massachusetts. And that was seeing the amount of people that were moving in versus moving out. And unfortunately, in the last decade, we've seen more people wanting to move out than move in. So that really led Jim to the second question, that is, why is that? And so we spent a lot of time looking specifically at the common characteristics of the top 11 states that folks from Massachusetts were moving to. And it was really quite interesting. Certain themes started to come out. And the third part was really to help policymakers uh, using this extensive research that we did. We spent nine months on the study. And by the way, there will not be a quiz at the end of this, uh, but we will try to do this and boil down the essence of this project in the uh, findings for you. Go ahead. So really, there's five major trends that came out. And the first one in particular is that out-migration is increasing rapidly within Massachusetts. Uh, with that, though, there's an impact on not only population, but also the composition of the workforce. What is really interesting about this trend in particular, and I think that uh, listenership here will find interesting, is that this trend itself has been growing. So every state in the nation itself has an ebb and flow of migration. 
But when you see a population not growing at even the rate of the U.S. population, that's Massachusetts, and on top of it, you see a workforce declining, that's in, like in Massachusetts, we've seen a drop of 96,000 workers uh, since 2018. That's concerning. Because really what drives you, this economy in Massachusetts, of course, it is a knowledge-based economy. So if our workforce and population is not growing, then we can't expect to have future economic growth. So that was the first trend. Uh, okay, the second trend, growing exodus of the prime age workforce. This was interesting because in essence, there've been other studies that have looked at the 26 to 34 age group. And Jim, that is the primary group that's leaving Massachusetts. However, what we found in particular was it was the whole arc from 26 all the way up to 65, we saw lots of groups that were leaving. So this is not just a young age worker, prime age group work, workers leaving. It's actually a, a much more significant issue that uh, needs to be addressed. You know, why would people from 26 to 64 be leaving the state, for example? Okay, then the third trend was really looking at the three, the, you know, the main outbound states, and there were 11. And through the last decade, they've been pretty consistent. Yep. And that's, it's not just your Floridas or New Hampshire's, but there's been some nuggets of surprise, including Maine has become uh, one of those destination states for those in Massachusetts. Uh, the fourth trend uh, that we found in particular was really to move two states ranked significantly better in certain drivers. In particular, uh, income tax was lower in these 11 states uh, in regard to, for example, cost of housing, and then finally, of course, cost of health care. Now, we'll get into this, Jim, in a little more detail, but what's so interesting, in this study, we separated the cost of health care versus the quality. In Massachusetts, we love to crow and say, you know, the quality is quite high here, right? But where we've done so well on quality, the cost, we have not focused on. And we're seeing that the, the move to states have done a much better job controlling the cost of health care. And then the last trend, of course, is net out migration. And if you look at it, it's not just an issue about migration of people, but when people leave, they, of course, take their money with them. And that includes the adjusted gross income. And then, of course, Jim, as you know, it, it's their income. And we're seeing that as being a billion dollar problem. Uh, just quickly, in regard to where we are, uh, many have thought that migration, at least net migration, that is more people leaving the state than coming in, was really a COVID issue. And now that we've gone past COVID, um, we're actually going to get to normalized levels. The challenge, though, and in this graph in particular, if you go back to 2013, you see that actually the mass increase, we've had over a 1,100% increase since 2013 in regard to out-migration. That's concerning, and it isn't related specifically to COVID. Uh, COVID was what I call the adrenaline shot that actually moved out migration, maybe to the, the front page of the Boston Globe. This is a really interesting graph, uh, and we can actually delve into this a, a more. It's not only showing that the largest age group that's leaving the state is 26 to 35, it's very healthy in any state to see a nice influx of groups moving in and moving out. But what you see in this graph in particular is very consistent. And that is in every age category, there's more people actually basically leaving that, with the exception of under 26 than are actually moving in. And that's concerning from a population standpoint. And it's also concerning from a workforce composition standpoint. Now, this graph itself, in particular, Jim, it, it really looks at the top 11 states where people are moving. So not only are they moving, uh, taking their possessions and their money, but they're also going to Florida, New Hampshire. You can see it's like a horse race. This past week, we had the Preakness. And if this was a horse race, I, it looks like, you know, New Hampshire and, and Florida is going to be actually a, a tie. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have, of course, Maine picking up, North Carolina and Texas. And um, your home state of Rhode Island yeah. is, is looking very strong as well. In this study, one of the important things I mentioned earlier was looking at the common characteristics in particular of states that were getting traffic from Massachusetts. And what we saw, there were 10 attributes in particular. 
And of those 10 attributes, other states, the move-in states, um, did better than Massachusetts in seven out of those 10 attributes, whether it was income or health care, uh, housing costs, weather, um, obviously something that policymakers can't change, but housing burden, crime rate, and property tax. All these other states did much better in regard to scoring. The three areas, though, and I think to complement Massachusetts in particular is not surprising, public education, we come out on top economic health, and we measure economic health by looking at the bond rating of the state of Massachusetts, as well as looking at the low unemployment rate that we have here at, in Massachusetts. And then finally, the health care quality, which I referenced earlier, which is extremely high. On most of the national rankings, Massachusetts comes up one or two in regard to health care quality. And then finally, when we're looking at sort of migration, we mentioned that the numbers themselves have been escalating, increasing since 2013 by 1,100% on an annualized basis, increasing by almost 28%. That's net migration per year. So if we assume that that same rate is going to happen in the next five, six years, by 2030, we're looking at out migration of 96,000 people. And that becomes material and what does have significant economic impact. And then finally, what is the economic in impact? Not only do we see 96,000 people leaving by 2030, but they're taking roughly $19.2 billion worth of just gross income with them. And also the next slide shows the amount of tax revenue that would be lost is almost a billion dollars. Now, this study was very narrow in its focus. It looked at adjusted gross income and tax. And as Jim, as, as we've talked about in the past, we didn't look at inheritance tax. Right. We didn't look at the loss of sales tax in the state, and we didn't even look at, for example, the loss of the economic power of spending that these individuals take with them when they leave the state. Okay. Good. Okay. Well, let's let's do this. Let, let's have a, a bit of a conversation. That's a lot to digest quickly. Um, if I could ask, maybe just to start with, you talk to people in the street and they'll say, unemployment rate, it's pretty low, people are hiring, um, what's the big deal here? Can you give us sort of a quick uh, overview of the, you've outlined some of them, but give us, a, why does out migration matter? Sure, and when we look at Massachusetts, you're absolutely correct. I mean, our unemployment rate's 2.9% as of April. That's something to be very proud of. Yeah. Uh, nationally, it's 3.9%. The challenge here, of course, is that as out-migration continues to accelerate, yep. not only do we have slowing of our population growth, but we also have a reduction in our workforce, our prime age workforce. So in essence, our intellectual capital becomes more scarce. And as companies come here to try to hire, they'll find it more difficult to find the quality they need. And it increases the likelihood they'll go elsewhere. So you're at Boston University, great university here. We have many great universities. A lot of people are coming into uh, the greater Boston, the Massachusetts area because of the, the attractiveness of our universities. Is this in part a matter of, look, we get so much talent that comes in, we're watching a lot of it wash back out and that concerns us or is it much deeper than that? I think it's much deeper. When we look at our universities across Massachusetts, I mean, we have over 140 colleges and universities throughout Massachusetts. Just within the, what, the 495 Bellway, we have, what, 36 to 40. We have over 300,000 students that come each year. We educate these students. Uh, in the past, these students themselves, many of them from other countries as well, would stay here, get employed, and uh, would help this knowledge-based economy we have in Massachusetts grow. The concern, of course, is as we're seeing more of these this raw material being educated here, but then saying at a very young age, I want to get out of here, right. uh, then that doesn't allow for economic growth. I'll give an example. A 30-year-old that leaves here, Massachusetts, and goes to, let's say, Portland, Maine, is a bigger economic challenge for Massachusetts than a retiree that moves to Boca Raton at 70. So the challenge here is we need to be able to not only attract and retain, but continue to grow our population and our strong workforce. And I think it's of concern for universities if we can't keep and retain. I mean, I'll ask the audience, uh, 
I can't really see your hands, but raise your hand if you went to a college within this Massachusetts, New England area, and that experience caused you in part to want to stay here in New England. And we know there was a strong connection. Now, imagine going forward, let's say five, 10 years from now, and you're finding more and more folks are getting educated here, but not staying here. So that growth that we experienced and enjoyed over the last several decades is something that we need to plan for if we're not gonna have it in the future. So you talked a little bit about COVID, COVID as the, I think you call it the, the adrenaline shot, right? right? What's the long-term impact of that in terms of work from home and how much of this is related to that, do you think? Were you able to disentangle that from taxes and healthcare costs and housing costs? Well, what's so interesting is the workplace has changed. COVID dispelled a myth and that is the myth was that you have to be in the office to be efficient. And there's been lots of academic studies that have proven you can work remote and be efficient. And we're seeing that across not just Massachusetts, but the United States, that a three-day work day within a work week within the office is standard. And it's not unusual to have two days out of the office. Um, in Massachusetts, also, because of post-COVID, the work environment is we are, have one of the highest remote workers in the country. Massachusetts is a top five state in regard to that. And being a remote worker, that increases the leverage of workers and also of businesses decide where they want to locate. Sure. And also the leverage of, I can try a company for a while. I can try a state for a while besides that before I decide to make a commitment. And so that changes the whole dynamics. The barrier to exit is a lot less now because of COVID. I, I loved what was in the study, what, what was the core of the study, which is just a love of statistics, which you've always so, shown throughout your career, whether it's on baseball or it's on out migration right. in Massachusetts. Uh, and look, you, what I appreciated that, that stems from that is um, you underscored every step of the way that it's a multifactorial problem. It's not just taxes, it's not just housing, it's not just healthcare costs, right? And this is the black box of human reality, which is we move for lots of different reasons. It could be love interest, it could be all kinds of stuff. But you did get at the end of the day down to three core drivers. And I'd love it if you could unpack them a little more. Again, that's housing costs, healthcare costs, and income taxes. Can you share a bit sure. more on that? Sure. What was very interesting about the study itself is in as you get into the study a little bit more, you'll see a heat map. And we took 10 drivers and we actually used a heat map approach to understand the level of significance. And what rose to the surface, of course, was states that had lower income tax, states that had lower housing costs, and states that actually had in particular, uh, which Jim mentioned before. Go ahead. I don't know. Oh, no, the third the third aspect that you wanted oh, to- Oh, income taxes, yeah. Well, we talked income tax, we talked basically housing costs. Yeah. Right. But then there's healthcare costs. And, and the healthcare costs, yeah. yeah. So, so it became very, very clear that those are the three main drivers. Now to unpack it, if you look at income tax, states like Florida in particular, uh, New Hampshire clearly have an advantage uh, over Massachusetts, but yet it would be actually the wrong decision just to say to slash taxes, that'll solve the problem. Because we know that's a short-term solution to gain lots of revenue up front, but it has long-term implications in regard to supporting the needed revenue uh, and infrastructure that's needed actually to keep new folks happy and content. So um, I guess that's a, a longer way of saying um, income tax was a driver, but not only the driver. Housing costs as well became very apparent. I mean, that's not a surprise to anyone who lives in Massachusetts or anyone that's coming to Massachusetts, housing costs are expensive. What was surprising in the study was that when we look at what Massachusetts is doing, it's focusing on housing costs as if that's going to solve the problem. And the reality is we know that it'll take much more than just that. Uh, using an analogy of a baseball team, a good baseball team doesn't just have good pitting, hitting. It has to have good pitching and it has to have actually good catching. So it's a combination. So in essence, in Massachusetts in particular, uh, there needs to be more focus than just on how to reduce housing costs. Now, housing costs itself, we've had a lot of pushback. The state has come out, the governor has really supported, and I, I give the governor lots of credit for this, and, and that is to move forward in these communities uh, with the MBTA property in developing it. 
Uh, the attorney general has actually had to sue Milton. And uh, I applaud that in the sense that, you know, this is law. So for these towns now to not um, obey the law, then that's a problem. We need to make housing reasonable. So that is a second study finding uh, within this. And then the third that we talked about in particular has to do with health care cost. What we did in the study, we separated the, the cost versus the quality of health care. We know Massachusetts is at the very top in regard to the quality of health care. But in regard to cost, too, it's, it's at the very top. And that's something that we're finding uh, as individuals get older and they start thinking more about their health care and the general cost that they need to actually get that under control. So states that seemed in the study that, that controlled health care costs better also seem to get trafficked. Again, all 11 states, 100% of them, did better in those three areas that Jim had mentioned. And that was, to us, uh, surprising. Mark, let's focus for a second on 26 to 34-year-olds. Um, th those are sort of eye-popping. The graph is eye-popping in, in that regard. Right. I, mean, I don't think folks expected that to be the place where there was the highest level of out-migration. Can you unpack for us a little bit the differentiation by income level? So folks who are 26 to 34 years old who are earning over 200000 versus 100000 are there any differences there and do you have any takeaways from that? Sure. One of the surprising things is, although 26 to 34 is the largest group that's leaving, the, the largest group with the highest adjusted gross income right, is, is that group that's actually 55 to 64. Now, that's interesting. What that means is that's a lot of wealth leaving. Now, the 26 to 34 group is very important because when you look at that group, not only is it the largest, but it's the second largest in regard to adjusted gross income leaving. These are not folks that are making, for example, just the average income in Massachusetts. Matter of fact, if we look, 52% of those that are leaving the state made 1.3 to actually 2.6 times over the average income in Massachusetts. So we can't say anymore that basically these individuals themselves are, are, are not high income leaving individuals. Well, let's take a look at uh, the 55 to 64 year olds, if we could just for a second. Um, it's uh, Florida and New Hampshire are about 70% of the people who are leaving. Um, is this all about what it's always been about? Is there anything new in the study that says something about that level, the rate of departure, either to those states or those other destination states you studied? Well, I think what's going to be very key is in September, new census data is coming out, and we'll be able to test more about this trend. But based on the data we have, what we do know is Maine is getting a lot of folks we're also finding that in New England in particular, it's not that folks are leaving Massachusetts to go south. Over 50% of that population stay within New England. So to me, that says, and that's very interesting, that Maine is gaining. Uh, I mentioned earlier that Rhode Island is gaining, and even a state like Vermont, which is kind of quirky because in regard to tax, right? if you look at their tax rate, it is, it's a relatively high tax rate, yep. but it's gaining more and more. And I think it has to do with remote yep. work. On the main side, could will we be able to understand whether that's also a housing-related move, if there's lower ho housing costs there? What, what will give us that kind of data? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, well, the housing is key. That's, that's one of the, the key drivers. Uh, Maine's income tax mm -hmm. levels are lower, yep. and then we know health care costs are also lower. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. Um, you talked a, a bit about uh, the projections out to 2030 as to what the impact on the Massachusetts uh, budget picture might be, the revenue picture in, in particular. Um, today, we, have, we saw in the news, Matt Stout uh, reported that there was um, perhaps $1.8 billion coming through the tax hike amendment on the revenue streams. Uh, does that give you any pause or how do you think about that compared to the 2030 number that you put up if the trends continue a loss of I think it's 900 plus million dollars a year well the trend numbers themselves the fact that more people more moving trucks are moving out of the state than moving in says that our citizens are voting with their feet yep. and that they like other states better um short run we may be getting more tax revenue when we're you know increasing our taxes right but long term 
the data, the U.S. Census data, and then the IRS data is going to be very helpful to tell us what that trend means. Uh, I would be surprised, for example, that having higher taxes won't actually um, help increase the net out migration. Yeah, that, that makes sense. So uh, we've talked a lot about uh, problems, challenges. Um, you've shared a few thoughts. Uh, you were also talking about the governor's um, priority uh, of housing and how she's been all over that. Um, would love to hear some of your thoughts as to how we can change that. Maybe we could avoid the the uh, the, the solution that we get people to have more babies because that's a really expensive thing that doesn't really work out in most any country I've looked at. But what are some of the other solutions we can push on? Well, I'm glad you mentioned babies because I've heard that a lot. It, it, folks say, well, why don't we just you know have more actually kids and we'll solve this problem. Across, this is, this is a problem since the baby boomer bust. We've had reductions in population, uh, new births. In Massachusetts, we have probably on average five to 6,000 new births net deaths. So you can see that births aren't gonna get us where we need to go. So how do we get there? Um, you know, we need to not only sort of retain and encourage, but we need to also grow. And I think we have to have incentives that target groups, individuals, age groups, and also skill sets that will help support our businesses. And that is our tech first businesses and where the governor in particular in the economic development group feel within the governor's office that uh, Massachusetts needs to go in the future. I mean, clearly real estate, commercial real estate is being clobbered right now. We're seeing a reduction that as vacancy rates are up to 18%. Uh, there are studies that are out already saying that we're probably gonna lose in the next five years, $1.4 billion in tax revenue just in the city of Boston on commercial real estate. So this speaks really to the need to structurally, and, and I think hopefully the, the goal of not only this study, but hopefully it is to actually increase awareness even more and, and for action that this is not, you know, this is not a fluke. It, it's a trend that needs to be changed. We, we can't sit as a state on our laurels and just say, aren't we great? I mean, we have, Massachusetts has been a very strong economy, but we need to continue to be nimble and listen to those that are leaving. Uh, I would hope that another thing that the governor's office would do, or basically a nonprofit would do a, a survey of those that are exiting. We have survey materials that come out from moving companies, but they're really just not detailed surveys. We need really more empirical construct and design surveys to help us better understand uh, also why people are leaving. It seems like a lot of these challenges that have really high barriers to uh, success. I mean, if we look at housing, we've got the MBTA Communities Act, I think it was the Globe that reported that the actual yield from that's gonna be relatively low uh, because of the ways in which the zoning has been articulated. Uh, one of the major rep um, reforms that people are talking about is came in part through Pioneer is uh, accessory dwelling units. That's Those two things together will never get us to the solution that we have, need to get to. So we're back to trying to fight with localities. On the healthcare side, we've got a highly concentrated industry that does not want to give up market share. Um, how do we get through some of this stuff? Is, this, is there a way to pull people together to have these conversations and get to a solution? Well, the governor's office, I, I think it goes back to the governor making the this a priority, and that includes actually putting a committee of community leaders, business leaders together that actually problem solve this. Mm -hmm. So already it's been an initiative to look on reducing housing costs. Um, one of the high priorities here should be looking at the cost of healthcare and how to actually reduce that. Um, that is a competitive disadvantage that we currently have, and we need to focus more on our disadvantages now, because clearly in this study, we have seven out of 10 disadvantages that are causing in part people to move away. So this is a, uh, um, the, the issue that we do have in the state, I, I'll just share it. an anecdote is um, I was sitting on an airplane coming back from travel and I was, uh, there were 10 or 12 people in their 20s and 30s, all I think probably well compensated from the way they looked and they were yeah. traveling abroad and all that sort of stuff. And what was troubling was to me was they were talking about how one had said, the action's not in Massachusetts anymore. 
one was going to Tennessee, one was going to Texas, one was going to mm -hmm. Florida. Once that gets out, that we're starting to lose our mojo, that there isn't, there are not as many opportunities. It's harder to get that back. Um, is there anything we can do to survey that? Any things that we can do to actually understand more about the attitudes of young people? Yeah, I'm glad you brought up Tennessee. And it's a fact that folks that moved from Illinois, many of them moved to Tennessee. And so we're seeing these trends. Yep. Um, clearly, we need to address it. So what, what, I, what I think the first step is, is the acknowledgement. And I'm, it, with the coverage the Boston Globe's been doing, uh, the coverage, for example, Commonwealth Magazine's been doing, many others uh, in the Commonwealth. I feel that at this point, we're moving to the recognition part. Now the action part has to happen. Um, the, the big concern I have, of course, is looking back at that 4% wealth tax that was put in, I didn't see a lot of analysis that was done. I saw a lot of discussion about how much revenue would come in, but not the impact of how it would actually impact potentially net out migration. So I would hope that there would be a separate study. Uh, Boston University in particular will plan on doing that as well. And, but I would hope that be more uh, academics that are focusing on this to understand how best to actually impact public policy in a positive way. So Massachusetts continues to grow and continues to be first in many other things. So what I'd like to do is just to ask folks if they have questions, if they could put them into the chat. I have one more question I do wanna ask you, Mark. And that is um, what role, if any, uh, how substantial an effort should we be making to do sort of placemaking activities? That is to make the city more amenable, more attractive to younger folks who are trying to keep that 26 to 34 year old um, cohort stuck here, uh, committed here. Well, I had someone ask me after reading this study, and this is a very academic study, and they asked me, well, how about the nightlife in, in Boston? If it was better, could we keep our young? <laughs> I think it's much more complex than that. Um, I, I think the challenge we have is Massachusetts is an intellectual capital. There's no question about that. And we educate. The frustration that many of us have in the academic world is we educate these students, but they're not able to stay. We have many international students, top-notch international students that can't find jobs now that's more difficult. And so from a national standpoint, it seems like uh, colleges, uh, the state of Massachusetts, other states should focus on lobbying to make it easier for international students themselves to actually get jobs. Look, when we go back to the history of Massachusetts, we always have filled our gaps in the past with migration. Mm -hmm. And the, the challenge here uh, is it's now a politically charged word to say immigration. But the fact is, this is what this Massachusetts would, has always been our history. And so I think that's an area that we could improve. I lied, I have one more question by me. Um, so, <laughs> so, someone could look at the study and say, okay, I looked at the 11 destination states and the ones that um, that really perform very well against Massachusetts in terms of attracting talent away from the Commonwealth. Uh, is this a Republican or Republican-ish uh, problem? Maybe if I could turn that one on to say and just ask you, um, New York and California are blue states. They have an out-migration problem. The, for me, it, it probably just is comparable. So who's doing worse on this? Are we doing better than California? Are we doing better than New York? Um, are we, uh, do we have an even bigger out migration problem than they do? Where do we fit into that world? Yeah, we fit in the top 10. Okay. So if we look at sort of moving trucks, moving out, yeah. we're on the top 10 list. Yeah. And, and the concern that we have, of course, in Massachusetts is, is not just that, but our population is not growing. The, the US population is growing about a half a percent a year we're growing at actually half that rate. Uh, and that's concerning. And the fact that we lost roughly 96,000 of our workforce since 2018. So this is pre-COVID uh, is concerning. Yeah, that's great. Let's go to the audience's questions. And uh, Caitlin, if you could share. Sure. Um, so for our audience members, we'll be taking questions in the Q&A box, which is where everyone is asking. So thank you for that. Uh, Mark, to start us off, someone in the audience would like to know your number one recommendation to reverse this trend. If income tax is the number one driver, should we begin with trying to reverse the millionaire's tax? 
Well, I'm, I'm data driven. So my view is let's wait till the census data comes in in September. Look at the new IRS data as well. See, the census data tells us the migration, right? They help us under, better understand that the IRS data help, puts in the economics, the adjusted gross income, and also, for example, uh, the amount. So if we can put that together, then we can get a good sense um, about this 4% tax. So I would say, let's get the data first. And based on the data, uh, we can see whether it's had an impact, a negative impact on migration or not. Great. Uh, the next question from the audience is, how big of a factor is transportation and out migration? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, you know, the MBTA, remember when we were looking at, for example, hosting the Olympics and the committee itself, one of the big negatives was that we didn't have an infrastructure that could support it. Uh, fortunately, MBTA, as painful as it's been with, with lots of the repairs on the tracks and so forth, we're better than where we were, <laughs> but we are not that good. So I think transportation uh, is, is clearly an issue. Uh, we always now, if you want to look at the rankings, we're actually top five uh, states in regard to the highest traffic. Um, that's not a ranking you want to be on. Um, clearly, there's some changes that are happening in the Mass Pike, uh, especially around the Austin Brighton area. Uh, hopefully, those changes will actually reduce traffic, but that's a long term problem as well. Great. Uh, one of the additional questions we received was the extent to which immigration and other in migration impacts our net out migration. Yeah, we need more in migration. And, and that's that's the problem. The spigot in, there's more water leaving the bathtub than coming in. So I, it is not a comfortable feeling being in the bathtub. And increasingly, that's what's going to happen unless we get more folks in. So really, you know, I think the answer to that question, that, that sort of problem is to how do we incentivize and encourage more people to want to stay? I mean, our competitive advantage is that we have over 300,000 students that learn here. Many of them should want to stay here once they graduate. Let's increase the opportunity for them. I mean, I'll just throw this out. How about an incentive system where um, you'll get a discount if you go to a, a state university here in Massachusetts with the understanding that you will stay for four or six years and work? Um, you know, again, I don't want to carve up and create policy here, but there is ways in which to make, in better minds, to make um, basically incentives for our students to stay once they graduate. Uh, two related questions. Uh, the first being, did this study take a look at trends in business creation and how that might have affected? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I think that's the follow-up study. And that is from, it, from the lens of business. We really looked more the lens of individuals and families leaving, but we didn't look at the lens of businesses. That would be a very interesting study. And uh, I think we'd learn a lot from that as well. Um, let's see, one question about uh, the workforce. Uh, does higher productivity make up for work losses? Productivity is up, but we, but we reach a certain spot where you got to hire to, to improve. Um, I didn't do a study of productivity in, in Massachusetts, but we do have different dynamics that are happening now. And part of that has to do with uh, remote work. Uh, we're moving away from manufacturing-based economy, of course, here in Massachusetts. Um, we've moved away from that since the 70s. And now it's a question of how best do you get new workers in this larger workforce. Um, but yes, productivity is has increased, but that alone won't solve this problem. Meaning the other way of saying a robots alone won't solve the problem here. We need individuals. A uh, related question, are jobs also migrating or is the same work being done in different locations or did this study really focus on out migration only as it relates to residents? Yes, it focused on the latter. Uh, and that's, I would say the, the follow-up is not only businesses, a follow-up study a bit through the eyes of a business looking at businesses looking in Massachusetts, but also what jobs are leaving Massachusetts as well. Um, a question about the 26 to 34 year old group that's leaving. Are they more often with or without children? Well, this is really interesting because this is the family formulation stage. 
And this is where these individuals put down roots. I use that analogy saying if someone who moves from Massachusetts to Portland at 30, imagine that person, we lose as we the state, their spending power, we lose the ability, uh, taxing power over that individual for their whole lifetime, they don't move back. That's different than, of course, that 70-year-old moving to Boca Raton. So it's, it's of concern. Um, I would say one of the big findings here is that the 26 to 34 age group is significant in regard to number, but again, they're the second largest group in adjusted gross income that's also leaving. Uh, that's concerning. Um, another question from the chat about international immigrants and how they've always been very important to Massachusetts economy. How can we help increase that trend? Uh, through lobbying. Yeah, it, it is a political football right now, but the reality is, and universities to do a really good job, they need to not only basically educate these students, but also give them opportunities outside. Uh, these universities, such as Northeastern University and other universities are quite expensive. So these students should have the ability to actually work and actually uh, help the industries that are growing, the, the entrepreneurial industries within Massachusetts. FinTech is just taking off, for example. That's just one example outside the biotech sector. And we're, it's, FinTech is finding it hard to, to find, hire uh, international students. And the reason for that in part is because of the restrictions that are being imposed. Uh, a question on housing. Uh, in terms of housing, policy emphasis in Massachusetts seems to be centered on multifamily and apartment rentals. Do we need to discern whether more family type housing is needed as well as for a younger demographic, more single family homes and townhomes? Well, let's put it this way. I think the cut ought to be what's affordable. And it, we should have a line of what is affordable and we should give incentive to builders, maybe even tax breaks for builders that would provide affordable housing. Um, we see enough McMansions that are going in these various communities this is an opportunity then for actually a public-private partnership to provide housing stock that's needed. You know, the challenge here is the levers that we're talking about. You know, if you think about housing costs, it's taken years for housing costs to get to this level. So it's not going to be solved overnight. We also know health care costs. You think that's going to be solved overnight? It's going to take a while. The only lever the state has that can make significant change immediately is an analysis of looking at income tax and the impact it has on out migration. If that becomes a priority for the, the state to reduce and the stem out migration, then maybe that is, if the data supports it, the future data I referenced, maybe that's the direction that the state goes. So it's really um, back to my baseball analogy. I apologize to the group. Again, a good team has good pitching, good hitting and good catching. And so you need a combination, I think, of addressing these issues um, over time to really be effective. Uh, another question, who can Pioneer and other thought leaders partner with in the form of younger organizations thinking of these same topics who may have a younger audience or an influencer base to team with and get this message out? Well, fortunately, we have uh, colleges and universities <laughs> right here. You know, a lot of these students would love to stay here. They, they come here not just for the education, they come here also for the community and just the feel of being in Massachusetts. So I think that is, that is our strength. And I think we could actually focus on our strength and improve it and our ability to retain and also grow our population. Uh, a question, I've heard many anecdotes that many California residents are moving to Massachusetts because of the benefits, including welfare, healthcare, and housing. Is this a contributor to high Massachusetts healthcare and housing costs or income taxes? So I can't answer that question because I'm not an expert on healthcare costs, but I can tell you the data demonstrated that Massachusetts has done a really poor job in managing healthcare costs. Maybe a good job in quality of delivery, but not in cost. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, two more questions on housing. Uh, do property tax levels and climate requirements on new construction become counterproductive to fixing the housing crisis? Well, any costs that are going to be built into creating new homes, right, will basically be a barrier to affordable housing. And that's where I mentioned earlier about the incentive system 
there needs to be a collaborative approach of an incentive system for builders to encourage them to build uh, affordable housing. And whether that is to uh, relax zoning, is it to reduce fees, uh, to speed up the process in which to actually get building permits or a combination of incentives to builders. All the combination really is, is should be on the table, not off the table. All right, uh, one more question. Did you study the number of people who have moved to states like New Hampshire, but still work in Massachusetts as a way of studying the importance of housing costs? So move to a local state, but still continue to commute and work here. Right, we didn't look specifically at that. And that's a really great question in particular because anecdotally you hear stories but it would be very interesting. I think that's worthy of a survey as well. Um, but if you, you know, maybe you're one of those individuals that actually gets up six in the morning and to head south towards Boston and you get stuck in that traffic, there is a reason why so many people are heading south and working in Boston. Salaries are higher. And I'm assuming based on the flow of traffic, it also means that costs of housing and based on the study that showed the housing costs and also housing burden, which you really didn't discuss in this discussion, burden meaning the percentage of your income to actually your overall cost of housing is much lower in New Hampshire. Could we just step back for a second on that one, just maybe uh, share with the audience. Uh, New Hampshire, of course, is a place where a lot of Massachusetts residents are leaving for. Maine as well, you mentioned. Can you give us a sense of what's happening with Vermont or Connecticut or Rhode Island? Are they seeing an, a... Um, a, a commensurate sort of increase for Massachusetts? Yeah, so in Vermont, we're seeing an increase. And we that's fascinating because if you looked in Vermont specifically about income, their income tax is quite high. So that's surprising. So clearly folks are moving there for other reasons, right? Now we move to Connecticut and Connecticut's interesting because they also have high income tax. In 2022, the last year that this data was available, Connecticut was the second largest place that Massachusetts residents went to. Now, that could be an anomaly. Again, when the data comes out in September, we plan in, in, at BU to update the study and share it with policymakers. And based on the, the conversation today, I think I have a couple good <laughs> ideas of new studies as well. So I thank you very much uh, for providing that information. Uh, one more question. Uh, how much of this is out of local and state hands and is dependent on national policy changes? Well, we know migration is national. So that's a very good point. And that is that, but migration is like tide, it flows. So individuals have more ability, that is mobility, to move to one state or another. COVID, actually post-COVID world has allowed that as well. So we have to, as a state, we have to be nimble and make ourselves more attractive to that group that can make decisions, individuals, families, and also businesses that decide whether to stay here or reincorporate here or to leave here. So it's clearly we're competing against other states and that's where we need to look as Massachusetts. Are we competitive? And I would argue if, if Massachusetts was in my classroom, I would give them a B, B minus, maybe at best for being competitive relative to the other 11 states. The one thing I just would remind folks is that um, on the national level, federal policy does matter as far, as regards immigration and student visas, and that is an area where Massachusetts would greatly benefit from some changes that would allow for some of the graduates from BU or uh, MIT or others who are highly skilled to remain and build businesses here. But that's a that's a probably a smaller number. Mark, are there any regions in Massachusetts that are growing their population? Yeah, it seems like Worcester's growing. It's really quite interesting. And, you know, when we look at this out-migration as well, and, we're, and with out-migration, of course, is, is the, the tug and pull of basically working remote, we're seeing certain communities within the Boston area. For example, it's 44% of the population in Cambridge work remotely. In Newton, Massachusetts, it's almost the same exact number. So there's pockets. I think there, this study looked at statewide. I didn't go uh, county by county or town by town, but that would be also an interesting, the data's there to do that deep dive. So that would be a very interesting study as well. Okay, now you've given me four new studies. <laughs> <laughs>
this might give you another. Yeah. Uh, someone would like to know if non-economic reasons like culture were studied as factors for out migration. Uh, they, they were not. Uh, when we started this, we wanted to be data driven. So we chose 10 factors that could be measured and could be actually evaluated against uh, every state. So that's sort of where we left it. But there is acknowledgement that people move sometimes for non-economic reasons. Um, you know, Jim mentioned for love maybe, but it could be for uh, family reasons, um, an elderly parent that you need to take care of. So it's not economic by any means. So this isn't to say that economics is the only thing that moves and makes out migration, but based on this data, it's very clear that states that have certain characteristics acquire Massachusetts residents more than other states. Uh, a question about the MBTA Act. Uh, it says the act itself stays a little bit away from McMansions and legislates new housing near the train of each town, which typically typically can be higher po higher populated and include lower income sections of a town. Does this make sense for what's needed? Well, I think it's an important first step and the resources already allocated for this. Uh, it's already been approved and yet towns are giving a pushback. So on one hand, you know, we're trying to solve the problem, right? Data in the study proves where part of the problem is. On the other, towns are not accepting uh, what is legally required of them. So I think that's a problem. And that's where the attorney general needs to step in and be firm, uh, like we've seen with Milton. And that is, this is not acceptable behavior for towns. And so then we can break that log jam and hopefully get some lower cost housing in. Great, I think this last question will be a good one to end on. What can Massachusetts look at from the characteristics of the states that people are moving to and how can they adopt some of those characteristics? Yeah, and I think it's best practices. So, you know, one of the key things again is healthcare cost. You know, healthcare costs have been increasing greater than the rate of inflation for decades. And, and what we're seeing now is it's reaching this sort of critical point. So I think best practice would be Massachusetts addressing that. I think that can make Massachusetts stand out. Not only do we have strong public schools, not only do we have in particular strong healthcare, but we also now have um, healthcare costs under control. So I think that's best practices. I think we also have to look at the data in regard to the income tax, the 4% of wage tax, that is on what we call the millionaire tax. The question about that is, has that increased out migration? If the data says it has, then the state needs to weigh that cost versus the benefit of getting short-term gain from that. Um, yeah, so I think there's truly uh, best practices. I wouldn't say Florida is a great example of best practices um, in regard to public policy. Many constraints, uh, meaning infrastructure concerns and, and problems are happening now in Florida uh, because of their policies. We in Massachusetts need to continue to be very proud of what we've done and, and the foundation that's been laid over decades. But we also need, again, uh, to not rest on our laurels and we need to make some changes to improve. Thank you, Mark. I yes. really appreciate that. Uh, thanks yep. to the audience for questions. If I could turn it back to Andrew Horgan. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Mark. Uh, on behalf of everybody who joined us today, I just want to express my gratitude for what was really an eye-opening conversation and discussion today. For those of you who are interested in continuing the conversation around Massachusetts out migration problem, I want to make sure that you're aware of a new research initiative we're launching here at Pioneer, which will explore one of the key out migration issues that we talked about today, housing affordability. Pioneer's new senior fellow in residence and housing, Andrew McCoola, has just completed his inaugural study titled Supply Stagnation, the Root Cause of Greater Boston's Housing Crisis and How to Fix It. It will be released this Thursday, May 23rd, and will be the first in a series of research studies Andrew will be conducting in the coming months. We also have some great opportunities to engage with Pioneer both virtually and in person. This Thursday, we'll also have a webinar that will focus on civic virtue and language of democracy. 
On Wednesday, June 12th, we will be hosting a luncheon on the MCAS ballot initiative featuring Marty Walls, principal of Marty Walls and Associates, and Mary Tamer, Massachusetts Executive Director of Democrats for Education Reform. And for anyone who feels that any day on the golf course is a good day, we welcome you to join us for an exclusive outing at the historic Fishers Island Club happening on Tuesday, June 18th. If you'd like to learn anything more about these events or other opportunities to engage, please feel free to reach out to me at ahorgan at pioneerinstitute.org or contact us on our website, pioneerinstitute.org. And with that, I want to thank you for attending today for the great conversation and hope to see you at the next Pioneer event in the near future. Thanks so much.